So I guess we can go ahead and get started. Um, well, chapter 17 had to deal with immune disorders, basically, whether they were hyperactive or hypo, um, so underactive, over or underactive. Um, so chapter 18, we're dealing with diagnosing infections. A lot of this stuff is concepts, um, tests, things we've already learned about, but now actually putting them in a context of diagnosing the infections that we've kind of been getting introduced to this whole time. So that whenever we do move into the disease chapters in unit four, we start talking about, you know, how do you diagnose this infection? How do you treat this infection? Hopefully unit three has set us up in a pretty good place for that stuff. So, um, we're trying to identify an unknown bacteria. There are three different ways that we can approach this. Phenotypic, now, the way that you can kind of organize this, let's look at it this way. Immunologic, anything with an antibody. So if there's antibody antigen interaction. Genotypic, this is gonna be dealing with DNA or RNA sequence. And then phenotypic would be just pretty much anything else. So whether or not uh, it can metabolize something, so metabolism, positive or negative, that's probably the most common type of testing that we'll have. That's what we would call biochemical testing. But we also could be talking about um, colony morphology, cell shape or arrangement, or like um, staining properties, especially when we're characteristing, uh, characterizing things based on gram stains, gram positive or negative. So those are all phenotypic. Those aren't going to tell us um, any direct information about the genetic makeup of the organism. They're not going to be using any antibody identification of anything. So they're going to fall into that category. Um, uh, something that's useful as far as diagnosing not just infectious diseases, but any other types of diseases that your patients may have. Um, we have useful tests now that are point of care. And for those of you who work in hospitals, you might know what I'm talking about, but point of care deals with actually running the test bedside, essentially. So taking like a sample from a prick of a finger or a sample um, you know, from someone's IV and then running it in like a little cassette or something that you plug into another machine that reads it within you know, an hour or less, typically. Um, you'll have a result for some, maybe someone's A1C. You can even get basic uh, BMP results. They're not as reliable as running, you know, the actual chemistry tests on the chemistry machines, but they give you a sense of your patient's well-being, um, you know, pretty much bedside. You don't have to send it out. You don't have to wait on the lab to run the thing and get back to you or any of that. You can do them right then and there. So point of care analysis has become increasingly popular um, with certain uh, tests for uh, illnesses, I guess infectious illnesses, I'm trying to say, as well as non-infectious illnesses. All right, so this is just a breakdown of what we were just talking about, phenotypic, immunologic, and genotypic, um, relying on a genotype with DNA or RNA sequence. If you're running out DNA and RNA on a gel and then comparing the size of those DNA or RNA fragments, that still counts as a genotypic because it's relying on still the sequence of the DNA or the RNA. Um, for how where it's going to be cut and how it's going to run in that gel. All right, so how do we collect our samples? If we're talking about collecting it from the nasopharynx or the throat, um, whether you're coughing it up or sneezing it out or swabbing something, you know, you could have saliva samples. You got to sputum. You could have a swab at the back of the throat or back in the nasal cavity in the nares or something like that. Uh, blood samples, urine could be clean catch. Um, if the person is not uh, able to ambulate uh, or they had to have a catheter for other reasons, we can collect urine via catheter. Um, we have skin swabs as well as collection of skin um, samples by the scalpel. That could be biopsies or we could be like you know, scrapings off of the surface of the skin. Spinal taps uh, of the cerebrospinal fluid and the, typically the lumbar puncture. Um, feces, so actual stool samples, um, vaginal swabs or sticks, depending on whatever test we're looking at. 
um, collecting samples from um, the vaginal area. It could be related to testing for STIs. It could be as, um, something as simple as just yeast infections or something like that. And what I do want to say is what many of us have probably seen is some sort of iteration of the thing at the bottom, our um, sterile transport swab with carrier, they call it. Um, the swab itself is just a regular old plain old looking Q-tip inside of that plastic thing. Usually uh, we have a tamper evidence seal. So that red cap at the end, once you uh, twist it to remove the swab out, it breaks the seal and you would not be able to, you know, say that it hadn't been opened yet. And once it's been opened, it's assigned to whatever patient you're working with. We have a plastic case. It's usually a soft plastic case, and there's a reason for that. I don't mean super soft, but soft enough you can squeeze it. Um, we have our, it lo really looks exactly like a, a cotton swab in there. Um, transport medium at the bottom. And so that is whenever you sw swab somebody's throat or something, you put it back into that plastic case, and then you can squeeze the Q-tip at the bottom with that medium to get um, the Q-tip and whatever's on it happy and um, you know moisturized by the medium, getting ready to grow in the medium um, at least long enough to get it to stay alive to wherever location we're going to transport it to. Um, and then we have, at the, again, the chamber of the medium that we would squeeze to release it. And it, it, some of them break sort of like, um, you would have like a glow stick or something like that. Um, you like squeeze it to pop it and then it will release the liquid out. Um, to mix with your swab for transport. Um, a lot of the times, uh, labs in hospitals don't do extensive microbiology work. So they might do basic culturing, uh, to common things like staff or, or things like that, identify things like that, do a gram stain and whatever, but they don't have a lot available there for identification of more complicated species. So they'll send it out somewhere else. This even includes Baptist, right? So I don't know if you guys know this, but the entire Baptist system relies on DLO for testing. I mean, the entire Baptist system. That means if you are working at Baptist and you send a sample up to their lab, the people in that lab work for DLO, not Integris. So, just FYI, <laughs> they, are, they aren't paid by technically by Integris. Now DLO is 49% uh, owned by Integris and 51% owned by Quest Diagnostics, which is a nationwide company. But um, all of Integris's testing is done by DLO. So they rely quite heavily on that. So if you ever see somebody walking around with a DLO shirt on, because um, they, they have you know, to either wear a DLO shirt or scrubs, but um, they'll either have that on or they'll have their, like, their little lab coats that say DLO on them. They work for the lab, typically, if you see them at, at Integris Hospital. So um, they don't just do, my whole point is they don't just do, you know, phlebotomy that you would go to and get done or by your doctor and you go separately there to get it done. They're actually running the labs themselves. Um, the testing that I'm talking about that they don't do at like Baptist or something like that, that they're mailing out, they're mailing it out to DLO's central location where they will be doing the testing. It's here in Oklahoma City. Um, but still, they will be having it sent out by courier to go have the microbiology testing done there so that they can, don't have to have, you know, specified microbiologists at each location for, about, for Integris. They can um, just send to that one location, have all tested by microbiologists there. It makes it more efficient for them. Um, but, and that's not uncommon with a lot of other locations as well. Um, especially if we're talking about other hospitals that may rely more on like lab core or something, it's a similar concept, but um, whatever. Some of them have more in-house microbiology as well. Just depends on where you're working. So um, after you've collected your specimen, you need to transport it to your lab, um, store it appropriately, um, maybe even get a culture going if that's what you need to be doing. You might even uh, be waiting on something. So let's say you have a rare specimen that you want to culture, but you don't have the media for it. You might be waiting on the media to be delivered before you can swap you can uh, swap it onto a media. So you might be, have it sitting in a refrigerator for a little while before you can use it. And that just happens sometimes. But um, so we're meant to uh, keep it stable, preferably for at least several hours if not a couple of days in that media so that we can work with it later if you are ever ordering tests for a patient like trying to determine what they have or um, this person has a cough you're going to collect some sputum and you want acid fast um, stain done on it and you want a culture or something like this typically nowadays we order everything through a program like epic or something similar to that 
and you'll be you know, clicking through it or the doctor will order it and then it's up to you to collect it right as nursing staff. Um, back at some smaller hospitals still even, but um, really this was more back in the day stuff where we would have paper based orders. Um, even still if like Epic is down or something, they have to have like a backup system typically usually on um, paper or they might just be using like an old version like Care360 or something. But, um, but yeah, so the, the paper versions, you'll just check off whatever boxes, whatever your specimen is, whatever test you want. And then the whole bottom part is for the microbiology lab to fill out with whatever the results were so that it's all there in one location. So that when we go to bill the patient, it's all there. So this is more or less for billing than it is for diagnostics at all. Um, but yeah, that's how that goes, right? And um, we might want to use specialized media in order to help identify what we think the organism might be. If this person has some sort of sore throat and we think it is bacterial, maybe we think it's strep, how would you go about proving that without doing PCR? Or if you don't have some sort of rapid testing available, those would still fall in to our diagnostic mechanisms, of course, but there's a lot of other tests that we could do to break it down. We could use things like selective and differential media, which we inoculated in our lab the last time. Um, selective will, it says, enrich uh, specific kinds of specimens and then other things uh, won't be able to grow. So selecting for certain things to grow. Differential media, we're going to um, give definitive or um, uh, types of, of changes in the media that can tell you the difference between things. That's why it's differential. Um, based on metabolic byproducts and all sorts of stuff. Then we can get um, results. And we'll go over a little bit, a little bit of this in the lab whenever we're talking about our results on our plates. But um, this is just an example of a very, very small, basic kind of dichotomous key, like the one that we'll be using for our unknown reports. If you looked in your microscope and you saw that it was a cocci and you had done a gram stain, those cocci were gram positive. Later, you drop some um, dropperfuls of hydrogen peroxide to see whether or not it foams up or not. If it does foam up, then that means catalase is there. And if catalase is there and it um, is foaming up, that means that we're converting hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen with that enzyme. So some um, aerobic organisms should be able to deal with uh, oxygen byproducts. That's a common way that they do that. Um, it's also talking about we see irregular clusters, perhaps. Um, if it can only grow aerobically and not uh, ferment anything. So if something can ferment something, they're not strict aerobes. End of story, right? Because if you ferment something that's working without oxygen, so you can live without oxygen. So if you can ferment, then you are not a strict arrow. So we would mark that out. So um, let's say you can ferment, you make acid on your mannitol salt auger, let's say, right? Then you are more likely uh, to be facultative anaerobe and you're either gonna be staphylococcus or um, planococcus, which I don't know what planococcus is, but I guess that's our other genus option here. Um, so more likely than not, it's gonna end up being staphylococcus of some kind. So depending on what other tests you may run, you may even be able to narrow it down to Staphylococcus aureus versus other Staphylococcus species. Anyways, that's how that dichotomous key works. You'll just follow it down based on your results for whatever tests that you're looking at. This brings us to those biochemical tests. And already in our um, selective and differential media that we talked about in the lab, we have the presence of certain biochemical testing, whether or not your organism can break down a into B product. Um, they're going to be using an enzyme to achieve that. That's just how it always works. So whether or not that enzyme is present uh, means whether or not you're going to have the product that's going to cause the color change in the media. We've mentioned phenol red, and we're going to keep mentioning phenol red. It's going to keep popping up, but phenol red being a pH indicator. So if there's acid, it turns from its reddish orange color into yellow. And if it's basic alkaline, it'll turn from that reddish orange color into a pink, like bright pink. Um, and so you can tell based on those color changes, whether or not you've made acid or not as a byproduct. So if you turned mannitol from your mannitol salt auger into an acid by fermenting that, um, then you would turn that media from reddish into yellow. That tells you that that organism can ferment mannitol. That's what you're getting out of that. There's not any other sort of um, acid production that will be going on there because you know exactly what's gonna be in your media so that um, you can deal with that. 
or at least uh, interpret those results based on that knowledge. So, uh, so yeah, that's biochemical testing. So we already know, you know, a biochemical pathway from at least one of those um, media that we have in the lab. So it could be something like mannitol fermentation, or it could be lactose usage, like we saw with both McConkie and EMB, right? So those are, those are metabolic pathways too. So it's great. We're doing all this on individual, like a plate of mantle salt auger. We're doing um, a plate of EMB and we're going to test, you know, lactose usage versus mannitol usage. There's other tests we're going to do to look at um, sulfur gas production. We're going to look at gas production in general in anaerobic environments and all of this. There's these cards that exist, um, it's usually done by API. And these API cards have all these little tiny wells on them. And at the top, this is a, like an opening. And inside of here is just stuff that's already in there. And um, you'll open up the card and then you'll put a certain amount of liquid, like four drops or whatever of your culture. And it really is that like small of an amount. Four, five, maybe six drops of culture into each one. You'll fill it up, up to this line typically. If you want an anaerobic, no air in it, test to be performed, you just fill the rest of it up with oil so that air can't get to it. So you can test that sort of stuff. Anyway, as you can see here, so there's a lot of wells here. This is all one organism that we're testing, and each well represents a different biochemical test. So you could say, this is McConkie, this is the EMV, this is mantle salts auger, this is the SIM, this is, you know, whatever other test that this we could be running on, whatever. Um, so we have 49 tests or something on this one card. And um, based on whether, you know, well number two was positive or negative, based on a color change that occurred, or well, this well, positive or negative based on color change, and et cetera, whatever. Uh, positives will give you one point, negatives will give you zero points. So each row might add up. This one might have five positives, so five points here, two points here, and whatever, and so on and so forth. So five, two, one, one, three, you go into the computer system for API for this exact card that we're using, lactobacillus 50, and then type in, you know, whatever I just said, five, two, one, one, three. Um, and it'll tell you what organism it thinks it is. So uh, lactobacillus, I don't know what the example would be of that, but uh, San Francisco or something like that. So uh, those guys, that can actually help you diagnose just in one go, all of those individual tests that we'll be doing for the rest of the semester. Um, for example, what we would, and I'm gonna assume that we don't have our media today, I haven't gone in the lab yet, but I'm assuming we still don't have it. Um, if we did, we would have four phenol red um, carbohydrate fermentation tubes for four different carbs. Um, we would have MRVP media, which we can do two different tests with that, and then litmus milk. So that's um, four, one, one, so that's six for the gram positive and six for the gram negative. So 12 tubes. It's not unusual for us to be inoculating that many tubes every single day for the rest of the lab. So we're talking about 12 tubes right there. All of those could be easily knocked out in one of these cards all at once, right? Very expensive, much more expensive than the way we do it tube by tube or whatever, even though we're using so much freaking media, you know, we're using a whole tube's worth and just tiny little wells worth of whatever's in there. That's just how it goes, guys, unfortunately. Um, I actually tried to convince um, Dr. Bercala, who is uh, the Dean of STEM, and he used to, he's one of the, started the micro program basically, but I asked them, can we do this instead? Because this is what they do in hospitals, right? They're not going to do the individual media, let's be real here, um, unless they just need one test done. But most of the time they'll do a whole bunch all at once. And he was just like, it's just too cost prohibitive. So I've just, I've asked about it. It's just too expensive to have like everybody be able to do all of it. And we need you guys to get experience with learning the tests individually and how they work individually anyways. So sorry, I tried. <laughs> I tried to make it easier, but that's how this would work. It makes uh, the job a lot easier for the lab. Now, if this did suggest that it was a specific organism, let's say it said it was E. coli at the end of this, um, would you just go ahead and believe, yep, that's definitely E. coli. This person is diagnosed with E. coli. Probably not right. You'd probably go and confirm that with genetic testing too, just so that you know, you're know you not going ahead with treating somebody with an antibiotic that isn't gonna work for no reason which I read a story saying that now, of course I had to, I had to bring this up, but um, Chick-fil-A is now turning to serving chicken now that is used with, they use antibiotics on it because they're just not having quality chicken anymore. It's too, um, 
been too expensive to have chicken that they feel like meets their quality standards for people consuming their products. So now they're switching to allowing the use of chicken that has been, chickens have, while they're alive, been treated with antibiotics. But hopefully for right now, they're just leaning towards um, using chickens that are treated with antibiotics that are not medically important to human medicine so far, hopefully, right? So that's the, that's the fingers crossed type of a thing. Um, but yes, just so you guys know, that's a, that's a real thing that's going on with Chick-fil-A right now. They were pretty uh, proud of themselves for using chicken that did not have antibiotics about treatment for like no reason or whatever but it's just not working out for them turns out but fyi if you're interested okay so um another thing that we can do to tell the difference between some organisms and others so we can't use antimicrobial susceptibility so here we're talking about like antibiotic discs right kirby bauer some organisms you can use how big the zones of inhibition are for certain antibiotics to determine what organism it is Sometimes, not all organisms are going to give predictable patterns of sensitivity for certain antibiotics. Um, and it only allows us to have a presumptive identification. So if you're already doing testing for susceptibility anyways, um, you're gonna wanna do that anyways to, to treat your patient. Then this can also help you narrow it down to whether or not you think it could be streptococcus as opposed to some other gram positive that you might not be sure about. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's mostly used for uh, strep Streptococcus, Ostridium, and Pseudomonas. Most of these guys are actually pretty hardy um, organisms too. So, uh, all right. So next we have, so you can use Kirby Bauer for some identification. Next we have phage typing. This is a unique one and one that we don't really think of a lot. If you have a T4 bacteriophage, it's only going to infect E. coli. Each bacteriophage that ever exists only infects one species of bacteria. So if you have bacteria um, that you think might be salmonella and you have a bacteriophage that is supposed to be, you know, only infecting salmonella. So you might put your patient sample there and um, mix that phage in and see if there's any obvious indication of there being infection by the phage. If there is no infection, it's probably not salmonella. It's probably something else. If there is, then it will be salmonella. It has to be. So you can use that to identify as well. Um, so it says, even specifically here, uh, it's useful for identifying salmonella, um, especially there's so many different strains of salmonella. So just knowing that it is salmonella helps you narrow it down already um, compared to things like E. coli, right? E. coli and salmonella in a microscope, they look almost identical. They're little rods. Um, you can really tell the difference. They're both modile. Um, they both um, have several flagella sometimes different arrangements of them, but it just depends. You might not be staining for that. And they're enteric bacteria, so they're gonna be growing in the gut, they're gram negative. So telling the difference between salmonella and E. coli could be very difficult at face value, right? Just like with your initial sample. So this is one of the ways you can narrow it down even more. Using a bacteriophage, a virus that infects bacteria, um, targeting um, whatever organism you think your specimen might be to confirm its identity. All right. Um, the way, if you're looking at culturing like a patient sample and to determine whatever is going on with their body, right? We know that some of bacteria that can make people sick can be part of a normal biota situation, right? So good example here, um, E. coli. So we have a few colonies that grew up from our swab that turned out to be E. coli. That could be normal. That could be a normal part of your biota, right? especially if we're talking about from a fecal sample, most people have E. coli in their fecal samples, okay? It's, it's really super common. Um, so if you're seeing a few colonies of E. coli, that might just be normal stuff, not causing the infection of whatever your, your patient has. However, if you cultured it and it was like hella overgrowing with E. coli, or you just had a lot more than you would ever expect from a sample, from a fecal sample, um, that might mean an active infection. Right, so you can tell there already the significance clinically of um, what you're seeing on your culture. A few colonies that grow up versus hundreds of colonies that grow up might be indicative of biota versus infection. So you would need to know that. But if we're talking about something like a true pathogen, something that is always a pathogen and not gonna be part of your biota, like mycobacterium tuberculosis, you shouldn't have 
any tuberculosis bacteria in your body ever, right? So if it is there, it doesn't belong there. It's causing an infection. So any colonies at all would be considered um, indicative of an infection. So it is different than what we would see with the E. coli um, there. So just knowing that about the organisms that you're looking for can be helpful too. There are some drawbacks from some of these methods that we're talking about, whether it's the biochemical um, testing, like we're gonna, we're gonna be doing all the rest of the lab, um, or uh, you know, looking at you know, growth on a plate at all, looking at phage typing, any of that, or even susceptibility testing for Kirby Bauer, right? You have to culture it and wait for it to grow. Most average things are gonna grow at about 37 degrees Celsius, that's body temperature, you know, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And they're gonna prefer that if they are pathogens. And um, if you're growing them at that temperature, you're still lucky if you can get a culture to grow within a day. So for the most part, I'm sure you guys are aware of the fact that we grow our samples usually over 48 hours. That's at about 33 degrees Celsius in those, so that it doesn't overgrow too much is why we keep it at a lower temperature because they still do prefer 37. But, so we keep it lower for that. But some of those, if you guys know that you had a mycobacterium sample, for example, the uh, waxy ones that were acid fast, those guys grow slower than everything else. So they need those two days in order to grow up enough to interact with the media testing that we're doing. If we're looking at mycobacterium tuberculosis, they take quite a long time to multiply. Um, you could be waiting on it for like a week or something before you even get noticeable colonies. Um, if we're talking about like leprosy, so that's mycobacterium leprae, those can take a month just to go from one cell to two cells. So imagine how long it would take to get a colony if you're trying to culture it that way. So it's not very useful. So that these mechanisms, these ways of trying to identify something might be um, prohibitive in that way, uh, just taking too long. If your patient is laying there and you're trying to determine what this organism is um, and they're, you know, need treatment now, then that might not be something you're willing to put up with. So that's where we get into the serological methods, which is immunological methods, um, as well as the genetic methods. So those will be a little bit more quick. We don't have to rely too much on um, uh, that incubation period. Anyway, so this is just a rundown of what we kind of just talked about and um, whether it requires cultivating and stuff like that. So we're moving next into serology. Serology is part of immunology that deals with testing of serum. Go figure, right? So sero is serum. So this is an immunology test. Your antibodies are in your serum, right? So if I take your blood, let it coagulate, and then spin it in a centrifuge to separate out the solid from the liquid, the liquid that's left over is serum. Um, that's where your antibodies are going to be. And that's also where you might see antigens. They're usually not associated with your red blood cells, right? Um, so it kind of depends. We will often do testing that's immunologically based for antigens or antibodies um, using serum itself. And when we do, that's called serology. So that's what that's getting into here. Um, so we already know you can have an unknown antibody, but if, if you wanna know whether or not the person has the antibody, so yes, we're gonna believe it or not, get back into indirect and direct, okay? So it's coming, so get ready. So if you don't know if the person, person has the antibody for HIV, then you need to have a known antigen to test that, right? The HIV antigen has to be available to you so you can check to see if the antibody's there. Same thing, if you don't know if they have the antigen, the COVID antigen, let's say, then you better have an antibody to COVID to check for that antigen, right? So in order to do this testing, you have to have one or the other, the antibody or the antigen to check for the other one. So most uh, modern serological methods using serology concepts can test samples that are included um, as sera, urine, uh, CSF, whole tissue even, and saliva. And we're gonna get into the whole tissue one here in just a little bit, but it usually has to do with fluorescence of antibodies um, instead of enzymes like we had with ELISA. This is the basic concept for serology. If you guys think back to the last chapter when we were talking about identifying blood groups, we talked about agglutination, right? If you wanna check for somebody's A or B blood type, um, then it would you know, form these clumps with the antibody against it and da 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 So if you have red blood cells that have A on their surface, 
and whatever. So here's your little red blood cell guy. And it's got A on that surface. And we have antibodies that recognize A. Um, then it will cause this to stick with the other A across the way and whatever. And we remember how we can make those immune complexes. Well, it's very similar to what we have with this situation. We can cause all of these red blood cells with the A's on them to stick together by using anti-A antibodies. So that causes clumps to form and that is agglutination. We can use this concept not just for blood typing where we have anti-A looking for A in your blood, whether it clumps or not. If it clumps, you have A. If it doesn't, you didn't have A, right? We can use this concept by mixing uh, patient's serum. Um, do they have antibody to HIV, let's say? Mix it with a known HIV antigen, just mix them together and look for agglutination or precipitation from that. And there's a difference between agglutination and precipitation. Agglutination, we're dealing with cells, which is definitely the case with our blood typing, right? We have actual red blood cells that we are mixing. Um, if we're talking about precipitation, we're talking about um, not cells, but just antigen. So that's the difference here. But you'll still see some, um, like a clumping and it'll collect in the bottom of the well and look like a dot as opposed to diffuse, spread out, just mixture. That's the idea. So that's the difference there. Um, and it does, it does matter whenever you're reading your results. But anyways, that's how we might look for um, that. If we're looking, if we have a sample that we cultured from our patient's throat, let's say, and we find out which um, bacteria you cultured applies to the throat illness, mix it with serum against whatever you think it is. In this case, they think staph aureus is whatever the cause of this is. Staph aureus antibodies, mix it with the colony you picked out. Um, is it going to clump or not? If it does, then that is staph aureus. If it doesn't, then it's something else. So it's the same exact concepts, right, as what we were seeing with ELISA. We're just not relying on the enzyme color change. Here, we're just looking for clumping, really. So it's the basic concepts. Are we going to come back to this with ELISA? Yes. Are we going to come back to this with other things? Unfortunately, uh, it's not just going to be that. So here, you can already see it coming, y'all. Look at it. It's already coming. We're going to get into it. So the direct and the indirect. So we'll get back to that. All right. So visualizing your antigen antibody reactions. Um, when you have antibody binding to part the part of the antigen that it recognizes, which is called the epitope, right? You can't see it with the naked eye on its own, just that one interaction, right? That's just too small. It's proteins interacting. It makes no sense. So um, if we're, we're lucky, if we can see a visible coagulation, whether that is agglutination or precipitation, we're lucky to see that. There's other times that you um, will have to, you know, introduce something else like the color changing for ELISA or adding on a fluorescent marker, which we'll see in a moment. But um, we already talked about agglutination or precipitation. Um, agglutination involving whole cells like red blood cells or entire bacteria and precipitation dealing with soluble antigen. So just part of what you're looking for. Uh, but yeah, we'll look for settling, essentially. So the next test is going to be immunochromatography. It is a fancy way of telling you that you're going to have your sample moving down a wicking bit of paper or whatever, and then causing color change or not. So pregnancy tests and COVID tests, right, home tests. Um, both of these, you have your sample move down the paper, and then when it comes across whatever the reactive it thing is in those um, bars there, can or um, can cause a color change or not, depending on whether or not you're positive or negative. So that's how a lot of these at-home rapid tests work. It's how a lot of rapid tests can work in um, hospitals as well, even for other things. So um, this is called a lateral flow test because it's laying down flat and it's moving laterally. Uh, yeah, but it uses the same concept as other chromatography. If you guys probably didn't learn about chromatography too much, but um, it's the same concept. It's just moving along. Um, you know, flowing in a certain direction and then hitting that marker and changing the color. And Antibody titer can also be used um, to identify things during diagnosis. Not necessarily identify, but determine how recently you were infected. Um, if you have the antibody against the thing, then you had to be exposed to the thing. 
for example, um, how recently were you exposed to it? And we can monitor the strength of your antibody levels um, over time to see um, if you're still being exposed to the antigen or whatever it is. This is very useful for tracking HIV progress since we can't always test for the virus because it hides out in cells, right? So the antibodies can give you an answer there. So antibody titer is just a measure of the concentration of the antibodies in the sample, that's all. All right, moving on to serotyping. Serotyping is kind of what it sounds like. We're going to determine the type of bacteria based on how it reacts with serum. So we can identify from serum samples uh, reactivity of certain types of salmonella, let's say. And there's a whole bunch of different kinds of salmonella, but it might be based on whether it has a capsule, whether it has flagella, whether it has certain markers on the cell wall, and all sorts of stuff that we can subdivide each salmonella group into based on how it reacts with antibodies to these things. And that's a serotype. You've probably heard of serotypes of certain strains of uh, bacteria before. So that's all this is talking about, how they react to antibodies um, to certain things on their surfaces, typically. That's all a serotype is. Serotyping, telling the difference between bacteria based on how they react with antibodies. Um, Western blot, this is, I don't to think about this one. We, we learned a little bit about gel electrophoresis for DNA, right? How you have DNA fragments, you run electric current, the DNA is negative, so it runs to the positive. The smaller ones can move faster through the gel and the larger ones get stuck, right? That was DNA. You can do the same thing with protein and protein will move. Uh, so it's a different kind of gel um, and stuff, but it's the same principle. The small ones are moved faster and the large ones get stuck. So you move them, you separate them out in the gel so you don't have a big old massive sample. Once you've got all of your proteins separated out, you can transfer everything that's in that gel onto a membrane. It's just like a little piece of paper that you lay on top of it and use electricity to, instead of moving it through the gel, now just moving it shoop, onto a membrane. Now that it's on that membrane, you can take that piece of paper and um, incubate it with antibodies. And if the antibodies bind to those areas, you can see it through various mechanisms, um, whether that sample has or doesn't have the thing that you're targeting on uh, that. So once you separate it out, you're not just with this big old mess of proteins. You're looking at individual protein bars um, and then seeing if that antibody binds to the protein bar that it should. And that's what it is. So how do they look at those at those little markers? Because it's the same kind of, it looks the same as the DNA does. You get the little bands separated out and they're literally getting transferred onto the paper the exact same way they looked in the gel. And then you're just mixing antibody in and seeing if there is bars there or not, right? You can only see it if, they're, um, if the antibody binds with the bars. So you can separate it out as many proteins as you want. If, it, if the marker for staph isn't there, you're not gonna see crap on your membrane, right? So that's basically how that's going to look. It's extremely sensitive, extremely specific. Western blot is usually used for confirmation. Um, if you do ELISA, which we already know is very specific and sensitive, right? We've learned about that because it's antibody antigen interaction. It even gives you a little bit of a quantitative aspect. But if you have ELISA that indicates that somebody is um, HIV positive, then they will run a Western blot to confirm that. This is a very common way to confirm that um, in a laboratory setting. Super um, effective, very expensive because it has to be done by hand. There's no machines that can do this part. So um, when I did a lot of Western blot, I did tons of Western blots, y'all. And um, I had to have antibodies generated against my antigen that it doesn't normally exist in nature. So I have to have a company that would like engineer antibodies against it. So I give them my antigen and they put it in like mice or whatever and get antibodies. And then they send me options of which ones I think bind the best. And then they'll like keep those clones alive of mice or whatever so they can get my antibody. Super expensive to get something like these things done. And um, you know, and then we're just washing over this freaking piece of paper basically and just tossing it out after you're done. And it's just crazy to think about that. That's how they're gonna be doing these, these tests with things that are already established, sure, but that's how it had to start out too. Um, in order to actually see those lines, it's not like you can see antibody with the line on there, right? Even on the paper, you can't see it. So uh, we'll either label it with an enzyme type of thing that'll break down and make something you can actually see, like a color change like you would see with ELISA, but in the bar format. 
or um, more commonly, much more um, cost effective, believe it or not, is labeling it with something radioactive. So you can use um, radioactive antibodies and then go and take a picture of it with, for, you know, film that responds to radioactivity. And then you look at that and then that tells you where it is. And that's, I did that a lot at OU. They were cheaper than my graduate school books. But um, yeah, radioactive stuff, man, that was the cheaper version. So I just thought that was crazy. But Western blot is widely used in research and it is still used for confirmation of diagnostics now. So this is a uh, great, I forgot this picture was here. It would've been easier to show you this. You have your gel that you run out. Um, you get your bars that run out just like you would with DNA and imagine that there was on your gel a bar in about this location on the gel itself, but you can't see it, right? So we're gonna transfer onto the paper. This is your bar of interest. Um, we're gonna block everything that's on here so that random things can't just bind with the background or whatever, and um, introduce our antibodies. If it binds on there, uh, we can also have the uh, cleaving of color if we want to and uh, expose it to whatever the enzyme is. It's going to cause a color change and whatever. Now you see the bar on there, on there. That's the expensive version. Or you can just make it um, radioactive. But anyway, so that's how that Western blot will work. It's literally gel electrophoresis with proteins um, transferred to a paper and then look for the bar with antibody. Right, so that's all that is really. All right, immunofluorescence testing. We have direct and indirect. So here we're coming back to this. In the direct testing, no matter what kind of testing, if it is fluorescence, if it is ELISA, any of this, if we are asking the question, does the patient have the antigen? This is direct. We're looking for whether the patient has the antigen or not. That is a direct test. Um, in ELISA, that was our sandwich mechanism, right? In the other versions, we don't have to make sandwiches. It just works differently. But um, essentially here, we have a patient sample. Does the patient have the antigen? Or in this case, does the patient have syphilis? They introduce a uh, fluorescently labeled antibody that recognizes syphilis. Look at it under the microscope after they mix them together. And you can see quite clearly on here, these are bacterial cells that got labeled with those fluorescent antibodies. Those are syphilis cells. So that's that easy. All they're doing is mixing antibodies that are fluorescent. They glow literally in a microscope um, and seeing if they bind or not. They're not going to bind with anything, right? They only bind with syphilis cells. So if you see them, it's syphilis. If you don't, not syphilis. So that's a pretty straightforward uh, concept as well with immunofluorescence. It's pretty direct. That's what I kind of like about it. Um, and that binding is what allows you to see that. So then we have the indirect version. We want to know, does the patient have the antibody? Are they carrying around the antibody against whatever it is? Um, so we have our known antigen added to our patient serum that may or may not have the antibody. Um, and then a fluorescent tag antibody um, is used to identify uh, the, any of the, those interactions. So it's, just, it's essentially the same concept as the direct, but looking at it like the reverse way. But yeah. Um, so a lot like what we were having with ELISA with the indirect. Remember how we had an antibody recognizing whether the antibody was there? Like we had an antibody on antibody action. <laughs> That's what this is reacting with too. So it's going to detect whether there is antibody interaction there. So that's how that works. But yeah, so back to ELISA, the thing that we know, we all know, we're all familiar with and everything like that, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. Um, so it's an enzyme-linked because we've got an enzyme, not a fluorescent marker, right? So that enzyme, we introduce the substrate, the enzyme acts on, and it cleaves it and causes a color change if it is still there after all the washes. For the indirect ELISA, the question still, does the patient have the antibody? Um, so we're looking for antibodies against the microbe, and, and then we're going to check whether that antibody is still there after washes. If it is, it bound, bound to our known antigen that we added first, um, and then stayed there through the washes. So here is a pretty good example going back through to remind us how the indirect works. There is one side is going to end up being positive, and the other side is negative. So we add our known antigen, let's say, to uh, HIV. And that's going to stick inside of there. 
we add the patient sample. Does the patient have HIV or not? If it does over here on this side, we see it binding with the antigen. If it doesn't, it has other rando antibodies, it's not binding. So when we wash it out, it gets rinsed out, right? We wash this out, it still stays because it bound. We recognize that antibodies are still there with our little enzyme linked guys. These guys are gonna get washed out, add the substrate. That's gonna uh, not be able to stick to anything or get cleaved or nothing. So there is no color change here. And there is a color change here because everything's still stuck in there interacting with everything causing a color change. That's the indirect. So the sandwich ELISA, the direct ELISA, okay? We have our known antibody in the well. So we have our well, da -da -da -da. we have our known antibody. Let's say it's to COVID. Um, and we add the patient sample, right? They have COVID, so they've got a COVID antigen. And then we'll add the same antibody with the enzyme on there. Add it, it um, it's a little substrate, and then that's going to cause a color change. So that's how that would work. And there's a better picture here if you like pictures better. Known antibody against COVID, add the patient sample, it has COVID in it. Um, we recognize that with the enzyme and now add the substrate to cause a color change. Then we remember quite fondly what that 96 well plate could potentially look like. You could have more than one patient samples going on here. And of course, typically in most hospital settings, you're going to want to run multiples. So like we did with our tests that we mocked up like three at a time. All right, in vivo testing is similar to the serological tests. This includes um, these tuberculin reaction skin tests, the PPD skin tests for tuberculosis that we talked about in the other chapter, right? That was the type four hypersensitivity, delayed type related to your T cells. But here we're trying to elicit diagnosis of uh, tuberculosis essentially by exposing you to tuberculin in your skin. And if you have that T cell reaction, you get that swelling that stays that raised, um, you know, a reaction, then that is showing that you have been exposed at least previously to tuberculosis and, um, and that. So that's how we diagnose that. That's a diagnostic test. All right. So this brings us back to that concept of specificity versus sensitivity. I know this has been a while since we talked about this one, but it's back. So specificity, we're going to go through each of these. The property of a test to focus only on only a certain antibody or antigen and not other things, right? Doesn't react with unrelated things. Um, it's anything that has high specificity, has low false positive. You do potentially risk false negatives with this because of you might not be getting, you might test negative, you might be getting all the positives because you're trying not to test positive when it's not positive makes any sense, but yeah. Don't react with things that are not the thing you're looking for. Sensitivity, so this one depends on um, uh, false positives. This one is dependent on false negatives. So sensitivity is detecting even um, the most minute quantities of that antigen or whatever that you're looking for. Um, so if it's very highly sensitive, um, you will not have any false negatives. You should be detecting even the tiniest little speck of the antigen or antibody. You'll see it. Um, you might be overly sensitive. You may risk false positives in this case, but this is more or less sensitivity depends on its false, uh, false negative rate because you're trying to eliminate that. You want to recognize any tiny little bit of presence of that thing. Specificity, only interacting with the thing you're interested in, but not any other thing. So that's what. Okay, so that's kind of the differences there. Um, our genotypic diagnostic, we're gonna move into these. This is dealing with DNA sequences. And really this is more or less talking about either the presence of the DNA sequence that you're testing for, which is usually what we're talking about with PCR, or the matching up. So if like your sequence is A, 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 A in a part, then you might have a probe that's T, 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 T. And if they match up, then you'll be able to tell through whatever mechanism you're using to look at it, like fluorescence. So yeah, um, 
PCR, we already know this is going to be able to um, polymerase chain reaction, multiplying nucleic acid out. Um, you know, in the first round, one becomes two, then two becomes four, then four becomes eight, and eight becomes 16, right? It doubles every single time. Um, so the idea, you can do this with DNA or RNA. It's just typically you're going to turn your RNA into DNA first because it's easier to work with that way. It's more stable and easier to detect. So that's PCR. That's what it's going to be used for. You need to have a specific target in mind. So testing for one type of pathogen. There are tests apparently that are available that can test for more than one at one time, but it's not going to be able to usually delineate between them. So that's the unfortunate thing. But, um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different ways you can approach this. So you have to have a primer to test for a specific sequence that'll tell you this is E. coli or this is salmonella, whatever it is. Um, you can't just test for any old on a limb thing. There's different kinds of PCR tests we can run. Typically, you're going to see real-time PCR uh, that's going to have, if you have the A added on, then it'll have one color. If you add the T on, then it'll add the other color. G, one color. C, another color. And so on and so forth. So as you're adding them on, they blip up with different colors that the computer can detect um, and show you in real time which sequence is being built, essentially. Um, and it should only be the target sequence, right? Because that's what you made it for, to be specific. Um, so it's real time. You can actually see that happening. Otherwise, you're going to have to wait the three and a half hours for the whole thing to run. Um, reverse transcriptase PCR is turning um, RNA into DNA so that we can work with it that way. It's just easier. Um, the other ones, like multiplex PCR, this is primers for multiple organisms um, in case we're having trying to have a differential diagnosis going on. So you might have several wells that are designed for each well is an organism, but if they're all in one well, there's no way you can tell the difference whenever it's happening. You just know if it's positive or not. But it depends on what you're testing for. Hand bacterial can tell you if it's bacteria or not. That can be helpful too, potentially. I don't know anything about the lamp one, um, so don't worry about it. Next, we have hybridization. So PCR, looking at um, you know amplifying a specific sequence. If it amplifies, it's positive. If it doesn't, it's not the right sequence. It's not positive. Okay. Hybridization is probing. So if I have a gene that is, like I said previously, a a a a a a a, and I use a probe that's t t t t t t t. And, and we do washes and we come and it binds on and it doesn't wash away because it's stuck together because it matches up. And our probe was fluorescent or it has something else for us to identify it with. Um, then we can see whether or not there was a matchup or not. So that hybridization. So hybridizing on the uh, sample uh, with some sort of target targeting sequence to hybrid onto that A, A to T, G to C and so forth. So that's uh, probing. And um, the probe is the TTT thing with the marker on it and the genetic sequence we're looking for in the sample um, to allow us to see whether or not it's present. If we mark that TTTTT, whatever, with fluorescence and then look for that fluorescence in a cell sample that we might be looking at. So this is where we're talking about the whole cell samples, like a tissue sample. You can take a slice of the tissue and um, incubate it with your TTT, TT, whatever, and the fluorescence, and then look at it in a microscope to see if your cells glow or not. If they do, the TTT thing stuck on there, and now it's glowing, and you can see it in your microscope. So it's positive for whatever TTT is, is aiming to look for. Um, and that is fluorescent in situ hybridization. It's not in vivo because it's not in the human living body at the time, like we have with our skin tests, but it is in situ because we took actual cells to look at them and we're not looking at parts there. So um, this is fluorescent in situ hybridization or fish. Um, this is peptide nucleic acid fish testing for staph. So this is just laying out basically that concept that I just told you about. So we have a, a blood culture that's positive. We're going to do a gram stain. We see that there are irregular uh, clusters of cocci on here. So, hey, that's some staphylococci. Is this staphylococcus? Hmm, I don't know. So we take our TTTTT or whatever it is against staph aureus that's linked to a fluorescent mo molecule on that slide and uh, bind it and rinse it. And if it uh, maintains fluorescence, to see those cocci on there, then that bound on there, obviously. 
and that means that it's staph aureus. So this is, that's a sequence specific to staph aureus that we're using to match up. You can also do whole genome sequencing. It's pretty commonplace. It's pretty easy. It's pretty um, cheap now. I mean, we used to think of sequencing entire genomes as being, you know, very expensive and impossible and all this, but not anymore. So we can do um, pretty rapid analysis of drug resistant organisms to figure out what the genetic difference is between your drug resistant organism that your patient has versus the wild type, right, without it. Um, you can also do deep sequencing where a genome can be scanned and analyzed multiple times and then compared with itself to um, eliminate errors that can sometimes pop up during sequencing. So that's deep sequencing. A microarray is where you have a chip, essentially says chip. I say chip. It's like a microchip. It's a little bit larger. They are like little chips and there's little dots. Of, let's say you remember we just had those sequences of T, 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 T right, that we found our uh, staff with. There's one that might be T-T-T-T-T-T-T. There might be a A-A-A-A-A and whatever. And each one is associated with maybe staph, strep, um, enterococcus, E. coli, whatever it is. You have about 365 dots on a chip, on a little tiny chip. And then you put the patient sample and mix it with that whole thing and whichever dots it binds to. And the, the machine will be the one that's determining that. It's usually fluorescent but whatever dots it stays bound to after the rinses and everything, um, hey, it bound to the staph aureus dot. So this person probably has staph aureus. And then you can go back and confirm that with other testing if you wanted to, but that's how micro array, array works. You can test for a whole lot, a whole wide array of organisms or even strains of organisms if you need to narrow it down more. So it's pretty useful. This is kind of a picture of how that would work, but. Um, here it's using um, lasers. The lasers, by the way, are what makes the fluorescent thing glow. You didn't know that, but um, yeah. So looking for the different colors and the different spots on the actual chip will tell it what most likely that per person might have um, and what strains it's most likely to be. So a lab on a chip is a different thing. A lab on a chip, we're going to have a similar concept. We're going to have a little bit of patient fluid. Let's say it's a, a finger brick. Um, and you get blood from that and put it through a, a series of cartridges and expose them, and they're all going to test for several things all at once um, using that small amount of fluid. That's a lab on a chip, and it doesn't just have to be diagnosing infections. It can also test for a variety of other things um, for healthcare. We also have new chips that are employing CRISPR technologies that allow for um, more specific testing um, on certain diseases as well. So. Um, this is going to have a big impact on countries where it's um, harder to have a lot of different diagnostics, you know, like PCR machines and all this stuff. Um, now they can just have this one thing that can diagnose a whole bunch of things all at once and hopefully make it more um, achievable for uh, less wealthy countries. All right, then we have mass spec. Mass spectrometry has to deal with the mass, go figure, of certain molecules. A moldy TOF, I don't know what moldy stands for, okay, but I know TOF, T-O-F, is time of flight. The way that this works is we're going to be uh, taking a sample, striking on a metal plate typically, striking it with a laser, and then it will ionize. So like parts of it, whatever your patient's sample is, will fly off, essentially. And then we can measure how long they spend in the air and um, how quickly it takes for them to fly, and all this, and that lets you build an, a concept of exactly the molecular makeup of every single atom in that specimen, which is nuts to think about, but that's what Multitop does. So it's breaking things up ion by ion, essentially, and then um, measuring the weights of those ions that fly off. So you can get down to uh, molecular makeup of things. Um, they use this for detecting antibiotic susceptibilities, um, I don't know much about how they use these for those things, but I think it's a pretty cool concept. I had someone in um, the lab I used to work at, at OU who did this, like that was their specialty. Um, I just don't know enough about it myself. So anyways, these peaks just um, are determined by how many molecules appeared at that mass, essentially. And based on that, can they tell you uh, whether that person has or doesn't have infections or how much they're infected and all sorts of stuff. Pretty crazy. <laughs> All right, next we have imaging. Um, this is 
so obviously when we get into mass spectrometry um, and even lab on a chip, like these are not genetic anymore. We're into like the other category. So the on its own. But imaging, we're pretty familiar with this, right? MRI, CT, PET scans, x-rays. Um, we can look for areas that look concerning and then go in and biopsy and then do these other tests on those. Um, to, and that will uh, spare the patient from invasive exploratory procedures. So now we can pinpoint areas that we want to target, even use for needle biopsies, right? You can use a needle and go in without even having to do major surgery nowadays. So that's pretty useful. So um, imaging can be useful for setting that up. So our question, this chapter, why are there so many different diagnostic methods available if we have things like PCR? And of course, I'd remind you guys that, and we're going to do the uh, Kahoot, by the way. We have a little time. So um, I'll remind you guys that the reason we have other diagnostic methods is just because PCR is cost prohibitive for a lot of things. We don't have primers for everything readily available all the time. We need the other methods to give us options, really. All right, so let's do this. Have any of you guys in here been able to access the whiteboard for the reviews for either for any of the, those I said reviews the study things? Anybody tried that? I didn't bother logging. It makes you look two steps. Yeah. Yeah. All right, tests that are based on organisms' metabolic differences as determined by color change are known as? All right, so they're definitely uh, what we would call differential tests, and that's what we want to lean for you know, the most because that's what we've been learning the most lately. But if they are based on metabolic differences, it still would qualify as? biochemical tests. Biochemistry is just, you know, metabolism, basically. All right, tests that are based on organisms, metabolic differences as determined by color change. I think this is the same freaking question. It is, isn't it? Yeah, okay, it is. It's meant to be. Still, another term we can apply to this. Right, so this will be phenotypic, phenotypic. If it's based on color change um, and it's metabolic things, that's not immuno immunologic and it's not genetic. And we didn't talk about anything being hyperbolic. So yeah, it'll be phenotypic. Any media that changes colors as a result of the metabolic process of an organism is known as, you guys know this one. Same question, basically, in other terms. Yep, so this one's differential. Um, so this is finally coming back to what the original one was, what we thought it would be. All of these terms apply to this situation. They actually all do. So just uh, let's come with that's pointing at here. 
what, which tests can be used to determine certain bacterial identities based on antibiotic susceptibility? Right, that is Kirby Bauer. All right, what is phage typing? So one phage infects only one bacteria. So we can use that concept. Um, if it infects it, it is phage for this bacteria. Then we can diagnose, diagnose using that information. So what type of tests are serological tests? Okay, so serological tests, serology, um, this is going to be dealing with the presence of an antibody in the blood. So when we're talking about phenotypic tests, that means the tests themselves that we are conducting, um, they don't involve antibody and they don't involve testing for genetics, okay? Um, for immunological, it has to involve antibody in some way. Either you're looking for the patient having it or you're using antibody to find out. Um, and then genetic, you are testing the genetics in some way. So if it doesn't fall into those others, then it couldn't be all of them. Okay, next, I'm trying to send this email, sorry. What are indirect immunological tests looking for in the patient? Indirect. Right. So indirect, looking for the presence of antibody in the patient. Very good job, Max. Number eight, what are direct immunological tests looking for in the patient? So next, the other one, other side. So this is presence of antigen, of course. Good work, good work. Uh, which of the following is highly specific and sensitive immunological confirmatory test? All right, so this is ELISA. Basically, the giveaway here is just that it's an immuno immunological test. Um, so yeah. All right, number 10, this could be more than one. Which immunological test involves gel electrophoresis with proteins and a special filter paper where we'll use antibody antigen interactions for diagnosis? All right, so this is the Western blot. Good job. Good job, guys.
Gracias.